Hello, Jeff Zwerink here. Welcome back to Give and Take, the segment of our show where we explore important scientific ideas and see how they relate to the truth of Christianity. Today I'm joined by my friend and colleague, Dr. Fuzz Rana, and we're going to discuss SARS-CoV-2 and how it might point towards a creator. Fuzz, good to have you here today. Jeff, thanks for having me. So I know you've had this discovery you found that kind of piqued your interest in thinking about this. What's the discovery? Give us a little bit of background for it. Yeah, well, you know, when it comes to the SARS uh, coronavirus 2 and, and COVID-19, uh, there's a lot of things that are really unusual about COVID-19 as a disease, but also about the, the biology and the replication cycle of uh, the SARS coronavirus 2. And for example, one of the things that's unusual about COVID-19 is that patients that uh, recover from COVID-19 will actually test positive in, in PCR tests for uh, the COVID-19 virus or the SARS coronavirus 2. So, uh, so that's a test as though they have the virus even though they've right, recovered from the virus. Right, and, and the PCR test is detecting viral genetic material in the patient. So even though they don't have any symptoms, even though they're not infectious, they still are testing as if the viral genetic material is present. And so a team from MIT tried to figure out what was going on there. And bottom line is they discovered something unexpected, namely that it looks as if parts of the genetic material from the SARS coronavirus 2 actually will incorporate into the genome of host cells. And then once incorporated, the, those um, DNA sequences will begin to express RNA that produces viral products that's picked up by the immune system. And, and, and so it's uh, why the, you know, they are testing positive for the PCR test. That's just a fascinating discussion, especially since surrounding all this, there's this discussion of whether the vaccines change the genome or not. And to find out the virus itself may be doing that is really, that's kind of bizarre and ironic in one sense. But I, you know, we'll leave that conversation to the side. But this has, I, I, I've read your article, and this has something to do with or a connection at least to what are called endogenous retroviruses, which are a strong line of support for evolution. So kind of give us a little bit of background on what endogenous retroviruses are, and then I'm gonna follow up and ask, how does that play into right. support for evolution? So, I mean, at RTB, our position is that human beings are, are the uh, handiwork of a creator. And one of the, the arguments against the idea that we're the, the, the product of a creator's handiwork and in favor of the fact that we have an evolutionary history is the presence of what's called junk DNA mm -hmm. in our genome. And one category of junk DNA are called endogenous retroviruses. And about 8% of our genome is made up of, again, these endogenous retroviruses. Now, where this becomes potentially problematic is that many of the uh, endogenous retrovirus sequences in the human genome are found in the genomes of the great apes, mm -hmm. where the sequences are nearly similar and the location in the genomes is, is similar, it corresponds. And so people argue, well, this is reflecting our evolutionary history, where mm. these endogenous retroviruses arose uh, you know, in the common ancestor of humans and the great apes, and were retained as the different evolutionary lineages diverged. And so they argue that these are molecular fossils that really describe our evolutionary history. So presumably we're talking about something where there's a viral infection that gets incorporated into the DNA and that you know, presumably happened in some ancestor that now right. gets pan out match. I mean, you know, so, I mean, is it common for viral material to be injected? In, that, that, in some sense, that doesn't seem like a big deal. Is there anything more to that that makes it look like there's a history to it? Yeah, well, you know, it, it is common for some viruses to incorporate their DNA into the host genome. Mm -hmm. for, uh, for coronaviruses, that's really an unexpected mm -hmm. finding. But for retroviruses, that's part of their their replication cycle and their biology is they, they will incorporate their genetic material into the host genome. And if that happens in gametes or the, or the sex cells, it can be propagated to the next generation. And okay. so the argument is that this again is evidence for an ev our evolutionary history. Now, what's being assumed there, however, is the, the idea that these endogenous retroviruses are non-functional. 
-hmm. that we think we know how they may have arisen in the human genome. And if they're non-functional, then that makes a very powerful and compelling case for human evolution. Well, and, and is it not true there's even, off, do you often find uh, like mutations in them as well in, in the, you know, so there's similar mutations in not only the human, but in the chimp. And right, so, right. so it looks like, that, that, kind of bottom line, it seems like this is fairly powerful evidence for a common descent, if you will. It, it is. And in fact, I know people that say this is the evidence, mm -hmm. piece of evidence that really convinced them that humans must have, have evolved. But again, the assumption is, you know, these sequences are non-functional. Okay, so let's bring in this discussion about the sars corona of 2 virus. What about this discovery impacts this discussion? Yeah, well, I mean, what people believe is going on is that once the, you know, the genetic material from the sars coronavirus 2 is incorporated into the host genome, it is expressed, which means it produces RNA, and that RNA is producing viral products. And people believe that this is actually a type of DNA vaccine where these viral products are being, uh, are exp uh, the immune system is being exposed to these viral products on an ongoing basis. And this is actually triggering a, an ongoing immune response. So that is, hmm. it's part of the acquired immunity that people develop after being infected with, with SARS coronavirus too. And people believe that this may be a general mechanism actually hmm. You know that that is more widespread with RNA viruses that are in the same type of category as the coronavirus. So, so is this something that the the method of propagation of the corona or the, these RNA uh, viruses insert themselves into the DNA, or is this something about the human DNA that almost allows that to happen, or is that too simplistic of a question? Well, I mean, it's essentially, you know, you have to have the right enzymes present. Okay. And so retro, retroviruses have uh, an enzyme called reverse transcriptase that mediates the incorporation of its genetic material into the host mm -hmm. genome. Coronaviruses don't have that enzyme okay. associated with them. so. The team from MIT believes that there might there are these endogenous retroviral sequences in the human genome that may actually be activated as a result of the viral infection, which leads to their incorporation, you know, into the genome. So it's. I, it, I, I just find that kind of ironic that the virus is generating something within the cell that actually contributes to the cell being able to defend against it. So I, yeah, I find that interesting. But yeah. you know, so let's let's explore a little bit. How does this uh, deal with uh, whether we're common descent or not? Well, you know, if, if you're going to make the argument that the human genome is the product of a creator's handiwork, first and foremost, you have to have function for junk DNA, function mm -hmm. in this case for endogenous retroviruses. You have to explain why those sequences are shared with humans and the great apes, and you also have to explain why those sequences look like retroviral sequences. And uh, there are some clues in this work on the SARS coronavirus that help us towards that end, mm -hmm. where uh, you could argue that these endogenous retroviruses in our genome actually may be functioning like a DNA vaccine. And in mm -hmm. fact, we've observed that when viral infections take place in cells, endogenous retroviruses are expressed, which means that they very well could be producing kind of a, an immune response or triggering an immune response that is helping the body to respond to that viral infection uh, on a, rather quickly. And we know that when you express endogenous retroviral DNA, it actually uh, triggers what's known as the interferon response, which is part of our innate immunity. So this explains the fact that these endogenous retrovirus sequences may be functional. It explains why uh, they would look like viral DNA and it also explains why you would see those sequences not only in humans but in the great apes because this would be shared design as opposed to uh, evidence for shared uh, evolutionary ancestry. Well, thanks, Fuzz. I really appreciate your comments. You know, when we look out in the, in the record, especially as we're learning about the genome, we find evidence of things that people use to point towards the idea that we're all 
come from a common ancestor, that we are a product of common descent. But what's interesting is as, as we dig in, it almost looks like these evidences, particularly about endogenous retroviruses, they may actually find a more comfortable and a better home in a picture where we're the product of common design. You know, I'd encourage you to go to reasons.org, check out Fuzz's latest blog on this. It's called SARS-CoV-2 Biology Points Towards Endogenous Retrovirus Design. It'll give you some great insight, a lot of depth in how this all works, and tools that you can use to go out and show how even this latest disease points to the fact that there's a creator that created all of us.